So today we're going to talk about the factorial ANOVA. It has a lot of names, two-way, complex, all that stuff. It mean, It's the test you use when you have two different independent variables that um, are grouped together. The independent variables are grouped into categories. When do you use it? You have more than one independent variable, you use the factorial ANOVA. Super, super easy decision. What it tests? Well, it tests the impact of two or more variables and any interaction among these variables on the DV. So it tests, like a one-way ANOVA, it tests the effect of one independent variable on the dependent variable. So that's actually like a one-way ANOVA, like all the t-tests, that's all that does. But you have two of those, one for each of your independent variables, and then you have a test of the interaction among your two inter independent variables, which essentially the interaction is a test of linear slopes, and I'll explain that in a second. Why is the factorial ANOVA special? Why don't we just, you know, do a bunch of t-tests and all that? Well, you can do a bunch of t-tests. I'm not going to necessarily argue against that. But you get, you get a benefit of efficiency. So it's every one of your independent variables and your interaction are orthogonal in an ANOVA framework. So what this means is that your effect of your independent variable one is independent of the effect of your independent variable two on the dependent variable. So you get these purified effects. So you're kind of removing garbage from each effect at the same time. Remember I said scientists were in a battle to, you know, get rid of garbagey sound and find and find signal, we're trying to get rid of noise to find signal. Well, this is one way we do it. We put the math that goes into this removes all the sort of shared relationships between the two independent variables from the dependent variable so that each effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable is independent of each other. So you have these purified effects. So it's like they're almost controlled for, you can think of it that way. And you have this interaction term that allows you to test if something special happens when you put two independent variables together. And 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 that's all that's really all that's going on here is you have this very cool idea of an interaction. And we'll see that we'll see that in practice in a few slides. So what is an interaction? Mathematically it's a test among two, two slopes or more slopes. Are the slopes in your experimental design different from each other. Scientifically, it's more important than that. It tells us when something special happens when we put two variables together. It's like a chemical reaction. It's like an explosion. It's, it's something that really, really does, is unique to the combination of both factors together. And so that's all it is conceptually it's something special is happening when you combine these two factors so I think I think that's that's really great um, mathematically it's just a test of slopes now mixed versus between versus within now within everyone participates in every condition in a between factorial ANOVA Everyone only participates in one condition. In a mixed, you have at least you have one between variable and one within variable. That's basically how it works. One. Yeah, that's. I'm just gonna go from there. So now let's just get to brass tacks. You know we don't have time. If you want want a longer lecture, you can text me. I'll give you a longer one. But let's get to brass tacks here. Um, you know, my method for doing the steps and stuff was to kind of really build in your mind the idea of what you were doing. We're basically at the point where I think now it's time to, let's just get the brass tacks. We're in a weird situation, right? There's no need to stress ourselves out. Let's just do what we need to do. We need to know our null. We need to know what we're disproving. We need to get our data and we need to make interpretations. That's, that's what we're doing here. Um, so let me show you what I mean and then let me show you with an example. So number one, you know, I think it's important to know our null, null hypothesis. The means are the same, the means are the same, the slopes are the same. 
all of those translate to f equals 1. All of those have this picture right here. And all of these have different sources. We're testing the impact of independent variable 1 on the dependent variable, iv2 on the dependent variable, and the interaction of iv1 and iv2 on the independent variable, particularly asking, does something special happen when we put these variables together? We need to run our new stats program and get everything. Also, the stats program is pretty legit. You'll see that in a moment. From our stats, let's interpret what we know. We, we're going to have three F, F signals that are going to tell us about the three effects. Each of those tell us a signal-to-noise ratio. Our p-values tell us the probability of sampling an F statistic has or more extreme than the F statistic we sampled if the null were true. Partial eta squared, I'm going to explain. I'm going to go over that one more time. So I'm going to explain that in the next slide. And Cohen's D simply tells us the number of standard deviations apart among our two means. Now, in addition to this, every one of these stats, every one of these stats has a confidence interval in my program. And that tells you your, your faith in your estimate. And how you interpret it, you're, it's up to you. You know what they all mean now. You know, if, you're, if you have a Cohen's D from 0.01 to 900, you know you have an effect, but you, it might be the tiniest effect in the world, might be the largest effect. We need to improve our data. With the p-value stuff, you know, you might have an interval, you might have a p-value of 0.05, with an interval that goes from like 0.7 to 0.0001. But sometimes you'll find a p-value that has a very tight interval. I also think that you all will not struggle with interpreting a 95% confidence interval of p because on one end you have, would I, worst case scenario, would I reject or would I, would, or would I retain? Best case scenario, would I reject or would I retain? If both cases are the same, retain, and reject, like, you're pretty confident that there's nothing there. That, you know, you have a tight confidence interval around your p-value, and you're pretty confident there's nothing here, right? 95% of the time, the true, the true value is going to be in that confidence interval, or excuse me for F statistics, 90% of the time, because they're basically equivalent to 95%. They're just weird because that weird elephant-shaped distribution. So... Let me go over, let me go over eta squared one final time. This is all you need to know about it. And once I'm done, you can stop, you can stop paying attention to this slide, but essentially it tells you the percentage of the variation in the DV that was accounted for or caused by your independent variable. If, if your independent variable was you know, um, a manipulated variable, you can say cause. My variable caused this, period. Now, additionally, what's it mean, right? Well, the percentage of total variation in the data set that's caused by your effect. So it's a percentage measure. It tells you the percent. There's 100% to be accounted for. Did, how much of that 100% did your, did your independent variable account for? How much did your interaction account for? How much did your second independent variable account for? Now, it's called partial eta squared, and this is particularly important for factorial ANOVAs because what we do is we don't calculate the percentage of the total variation. What we do is we calculate the percentage of the total minus the other known effects. So before, we dealt with this once before, when we removed crap from our within subject's error when we knew individual differences. Well, here, when we're looking at the data, we know the variation due to our, our first independent variable, the variation due to our second, and the variation due to our third, right? Now, essentially, what we do when we look at eta squared is we just look at the, the variation that's reasonable to expect the first independent variable to predict. Now, it's unreasonable to expect one independent variable to predict variation in another independent variable when they're independent. So this is why the eta squared is partial. Now, interestingly, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just done there. It's a percentage measure. That's it. What percentage... 
of the dependent variable, that the independent variable, the other independent variable, or the interaction, what percentage of the variation in the dv that it should reasonably be allowed to predict, did it predict? It's just a percentage. And the interpretations of this effect are 1% is small, 9% is medium, some people say 13%. It's a little bit up for debate. Like to me, it's so minuscule, it doesn't matter. And then 25% is huge. So anything between 9 and 25% is good. And so 9% is our low level of good, 25 is our high level of good. And what you'll find is that the average of research in psychology is at a 9% effect rate. So when you, if you took personality and learned about the person situation controversy where personality measures only predict um, behavior by a correlation of 0.3, you square that 0.3, you get the 9%. So eta squared, this percentage relationship right here that we're talking about also works for correlations. You square a correlation, you get the same thing. The percentage of the variation in the dependent variable that your independent variable should reasonably predict, that could reasonably predict, did it predict? So it's just a percentage. If you want, ignore the little bit about reasonably predict, what percentage of the variation in the data that's relevant did this independent variable predict? That's it. Okay, before we go on to show you how to do this, I have some advice for you. You gotta love your graphs. You gotta spend time with the graphs. The first thing you're gonna do when you get data now is you're gonna look at the graph. You're, you're gonna try to figure out that pattern. You're gonna draw you a bath. You're gonna go ahead and, and play you some Drake. Yeah, you're gonna get in the mood. You're going to get in the mood and you're going to spend time and you're going to figure out what's going on. You're going to try to discover patterns. You're going to try to discover relationships. You're going to try to make sense of it. This data is lifeblood to me. Understanding truth is what I'm all about. This is not about completing a series of steps to be happy that I completed a series of steps that some man told me to do. And by man, I mean the man, right? Like, no, we do data because we love it. We want to look at it. We want to understand it. We want to discover things. So here we go. Here's a factorial data. Look at it. Spend some time with it. What's going on here is you have race of patients, you have patient income, and you have quality of pain treatment they received. What do you notice? Let's look at this together. Well, first, let's just get a sense for our main effects. Those orange and blue bars sure look different everywhere. That's, that would be a main effect of whatever variable's there. Let's look at that variable. Oh. It's race, so there's a racial disparity in pain treatment everywhere. So we can see that. That would be a main effect of race. Now, the other variable is class. And what you see there is that has people in general, you got to kind of like, what you got to do for this one is you got to average those blue and orange bars together to just one line, okay? So you average... You average the 8 and the 500 and the 10 and the 500 to 9. You average the 6 and the 9 to whatever that is, a little bit. We had that one's at 9, that one's at like 7 and a half. I'm not going to do math today. You average these two together, and you get another smaller number, and then you average these two together, and you get a smaller number. There appears to also be a main effect of class where the more economically disadvantaged you are, the worse pain treatment you get. Does something special happen when we put these two variables together? Go ahead, look at it. What do you notice? Right? Let's, let's look at some minute details. One of the things I notice is that folks that, and, and this is pretty in line with the research that exists, that folks who make like $500,000, half a million dollars, still are experiencing racial disparities. Right? And what we're looking at here is we're looking at slopes, right? 
and we'd see that those two slopes would eventually meet. And where they meet would be probably based on my projections about three and a half million dollars. So when I'm looking at that, that little observation, and I'm trying to understand what's going on here, I used my like eighth grade algebra skills and I just sort of took it out and extrapolated. It's okay, use your skills to understand the data. And what I found was that, oh, in this case, it looks like in order to be treated fairly in the United States, you have to make over three and a half million dollars. I would lead with that in my press release if I found this data. I'd be like, analyses in, statistical analyses indicate that in order to be treated fairly in America, you need to have $3.5 million to be treated like the, the person with an average salary in America of 50. That is a magnitude of order greater, right? And that's just me. I'm, I'm, I'm not done yet with this graph. I looked at that, and then I'm like, oh, my God. Look down at 15K. While class does reduce the quality of pain treatment one gets, I mean, it basically throws it into the ground and stomps on it for black people in America, right? Like, like that is relatively in line with the research that we observe. So, you know, I'm looking at these graphs, and, like, I was first just thinking about main effects and interactions, and now I'm thinking about patterns and quality. Yeah, class matters, but class and race intersect to really, really impact one's life, right? Race matters even, even up to three and a half million dollars, and I'd, I'd show that prediction, prediction with like a classic eighth grade y equals mx plus b. I would actually solve that equation. You know, and that's something I think we can do. We can use those skills we have. If not, I could help you figure that one out. But when I'm looking at data, I'm trying to figure out what's going on, what's truth. And I, before I ever look at my p-values, and I haven't looked at the p-values for this graph, I'm trying to figure out what have we discovered. And then if I'm going back to the question of the interaction, I definitely see a difference in slopes, right? The, the drop-off in quality pain treatment you know, based on income is much steeper for black, black folks in America and, and across the globe, actually. It's really a weird phenomenon that I study. So with that being stated, right, like it's, it's more than just going through the motions. It's trying to understand how everything works. And the first place to do that is with the picture. Conclusions, what did you discover? So when you do a problem now, you just have to, I do want your nulls, I want your data, and I want you to write down that data and make a conclusion from it. So essentially, write it down like you would for a research paper. Write it to me like you want to communicate it to me, okay? Um, like I'm a scientist. I don't really have strict rules in this, but I'd, I'd like you to start practicing writing these up like a scientist. Find your favorite article. I have some great ones. One of my favorite is Kim Zeppenfield and Cohen, where they tested the Freudian idea that, um, oh, what is it reaction formation? I, I think it is reaction formation. Or it's one of those. But basically the Freudian idea that when you think naughty thoughts, you have a drive to become more creative, to feel like a better person. So like they did test that. And they tested that in a great way by having people, um, they showed people these, like these four interesting photos. Two looked like older folks, and one looked like just this very attractive model. So you're looking at that. And then they said, oh, okay, look at these photos, and you did that. And then they come in a couple minutes later, and they're like, okay, so I'm sorry, I had to get my materials. So your task today is to write a story about these four, about these three people in this uh, on this picture now the thing is like folks have been struggling with this and so essentially we're going to give you we're going to give those characters sort of roles and you're just going to write about sort of a day in the life with these people now this is your father this is your mother and this is your sibling now remember this is 
as Marilyn Manson would say, a beautiful person, okay? This is, this is uh, pre-tested in our labs to be very attractive and very arousing and all that. And, and folks write about, um, you know, this person has their sibling. It's right a day in the life story, right? Nothing weird about this except for what's going on in one's mind. While you're writing about this sister or this brother or this sibling, you're kind of drooling. You're kind of kind of into it, you know? Like you're like, oh my god, it's my sister. Oh my, for me, it's my sister. For you, I don't know. Right, but for me, I'm like, oh, that's my sister. Oh my lord. When's this story going to be over? 15 minutes later, I'm done writing my story. You know, it's all these complicated instructions to get me to think about, you know, having Lannister relationships with my sibling. And then they give them clay and they say, uh, we just want you to make a, the best sculpture you can. Go make whatever you want. And then, then these suppressed sexual urges came out literally statistically in more creative statues and penis shaped, more penis shaped, phallic shaped structures. Um, I believe all the participants were men. I might be wrong on that. But like these are, this is why we do science. It's kind of fun. But it's to make discoveries. It's to test if ideas that we believe are true are true. And then even ones we don't want to be true do accept. We do have a study that suggests that repressed sexual drives lead to more creative and more phallic-shaped sculptures, which I think is just cool. But what did you discover in your study? I always viewed it like this is why I think I really got into it. From day one, I was like, I'm discovering shit. I'm discovering shit about human behavior. And that's so awesome. Let's learn one practical skill and then let's get, let's get us uh, some experience. So I made a new tool and it doesn't have you enter data the way SPSS does. I believe the way SPSS has you enter data um, actually harms you from being able, harms them from, from coding an easy to use um, tool. So for my tool, what you have to do is you have to list out your dependent variable. In a, in, a, in a row, and you have to list out the conditions, and you have to list out um, the participant ID. So let's just take some data poorly put up on this screen to force you to decode it as best as you can. So you have Mike in the empathy condition, okay? And then, you, and then it says treatment condition at white, they scored 10. Treatment condition at black, they scored 9. So this is sort of like based on my dissertation research because I was lazy. And, you know, I don't know. I just don't have time to read more articles right now. There's other things going on. I don't even know if anybody's watching these videos right now. I hope you all are doing okay, though. I really do. Um, but back to this. I see that there, Mike's in the empathy condition. And I'm looking at Lisa's in the control condition. They're not both in each. So I know that's a between subjects variable, empathy versus control. But then I see that they both did provided scores, treatments um, for white and black patients or targets. And so we have scores for those. Race then would be a within subjects variable in this design. So first thing we do, and that's just me kind of, I don't like to rush this stuff. I don't like to be wrong. When I am, I like kind of down on myself. So y'all saw that once in class um, when I was wrong. I was like, ah, oh, I should have not been wrong. Um, but... The first thing we do is we pull out the numbers. We got a 10, 9, 7, and 8, and we list those in a line. Then what we do is we pull out their IDs. So we got 10, 9, 7, 8. Then underneath, we have another line that is Mike, Mike, Lisa, Lisa. You can use numbers. I'm just going to use names to until we get the hang of this, right? Like My whole goal is to make sure you, you don't make silly mistakes, and so I'm going to teach you my way to do it first, that'll make sure that your first thought is like, oh, Mike, Mike, Lisa, not one, two, one, two. Okay? Um, that's because you want to know Mike and Lisa is different than independent variable one's conditions and independent variable two's conditions. 
So then again, underneath them, you write an independent variable one. What condition was present? Well, that was for the 10, that was Mike's score. He was in the empathy condition. So boom, empathy. For the 9, Mike's score in the empathy condition. Boom, again. So we got 10, 9. And then we got that 7, 8, which was not Mike. That was Lisa, and that's control, control. Boom, perfect. So we know that that 10, well, now I'm going to get through the last one. And then on the last condition, we know that 10 had a score, was associated with the condition of white. That 9 was associated with black. That 7 was associated with white. And that 8 was associated with with black. So now I'm, I'm going to put this all on a just table. You don't have to do this. I'm going to do this. I've already talked about that, so I'm just going to skip that real quick. Let's take a more complicated example. All right, I challenge myself here. I got, here's my, I have data here. And I only have the numbers that are right there. I have the names that go from Larry to Scary. They're all the same. I kind of had fun with that. Um, and I have their values for watching Fox News, being a Republican or Democrat, and the dependent variable social distancing. I'm using a relevant, a relevant question for today. Does political orientation interact with the news media that one watches to impact their own behavior and safety? And this kind of connects to my ideas of cultural psychology and social psychology as well, is that we are often sacrificed for the ideals and beliefs of our group. And we're happy to sacrifice that because in many cases, the ideals of our worldview, the idea that we have made sense of the world are more important than our own physical health and safety. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. So I'm not trying to pass judgment it's just right now we're in a, in a situation where the media cycle and political kind of belief system is causing people to go outside and hurt themselves and others. And I think that's really interesting and weird. I've noticed this consistent pattern where folks are willing to sacrifice their own lives for their beliefs. They'll probably regret that decision, but it's still there. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, we're going to enter this data. And we're going to have to enter that in my program. And so first thing we do, let's apply our algorithm. Start with the scores. So I just pulled out all the scores. I put them in a column. You have to type them in it. Not a column. I put them in a row. You have to type them like this, right? So then I'm like, okay, I put them in a nice little graph for this discussion. I want to figure out which participant the scores came from. So I got Larry, Barry, Harry, Jerry, Gary, Jerry, Mary, Carrie, Yerry, Zerry, Zerry, Derry, and Scary. Okay, so I was having fun on the whole Parks and Recreation Jerry name thing. If you didn't get it, that's okay. I'm kind of a dork. But still, you know, what we can see here right now, I know I shouldn't stop us in the middle of the algorithm, but I'll notice none of the names repeat, and that tells me the study design is. I'll tell you in a moment. Let's see what I do next. <laughs> All right, so my next thing, that score one, I know that was Larry's. Score five was Barry's. Score three was Harry's. And all I did was go over. So now I'm like, okay, that score of one, what level of IV1 did that score come from? So, you know, you can still see it there. So they watched Fox News. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So that's just literally the level of did they watch Fox? Do they watch Fox News or not willingly? Same thing for independent variable two. I'm saying score one is associated with a political orientation of Republican. Five is associated with political orientation of Republican. Three, eight, so forth, Republican up till nine. Seven, ten, six, nine, eight, and eight, those scores, not the number of scores, those actual scores, are associated with Democrat scores. So right now, this is how you enter your data. But before you do that, just take a moment. That one is impacted by Larry's individual differences, is impacted by watching Fox News, is impacted by being a Republican. I'm going over to Carrie 7. Carrie 7 is is impacted by Kerry's individual differences by um, watching Fox News and being a Democrat, okay? 
So that's how we set up our data. And then we're going to do what I told you, right? Like I'm going to answer your question. Well, let me answer that question. Do the names repeat? No. Well, if they don't repeat, this is a between subjects design. You have, if there's only, if the name is only present once or the ID is only present once, the, every participant in this study was only in one cell of your design. And when I say cell, it's like the conditions when you cross your two independent variables together. So you can sort of see that. They do not repeat in this case, so it's between. Now I'm going to use another, another data just to show you an example. Let's, let's say like we had different names in there. That's all that's going on here. And it may not make sense, but it's just it's just about figuring out what's going on. So we got, ooh, let's say these are all twins, okay? But we just named them by one of the twins because we struggle with getting the um, dependent samples t-test done correctly. Sorry, class, I still got to remember that. Ha ha, that was mean. I shouldn't have said that, but I, you know, you all know I mean it with care. Um, so now I've changed up the names, and I got my DVs in there, and I'm like. Okay, let's ask the question again. Do the names repeat? Yes. Do they, how many times do they repeat? Well, I got two Larrys, two Barrys, two Harrys, Jerry's, Mary's. Okay, so they repeat once. So there, there's two of them. And so I know the whole thing's not within because I have a two by two and the names would have to repeat four times for it to be completely within. So then what I'm looking at is I'm going to find Larry's scores. So Larry is yes and no, or yes and yes, so that's the same. So then it's IV2 that, IV, IV1 is the same, so that's a between subjects variable, right? Because Larry's only in one condition of IV1. He's only in the Y condition. But Larry is in both conditions of IV2, R and D, and so then, you know, we know that one is a within subjects variable. So IV1 is between and IV2 is within. So that's essentially it. Um, so here, let's do another example. We got Larry, Barry, Harry, Larry, Barry, Harry, Larry, Barry, Harry, and Larry, Barry, Harry. Four repeats, two by two. I know off the bat, it's within subjects design. I don't have to think about it too hard. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna take a magic school bus tour out to data land, which means I'm gonna insert a video right about here, and after that video, you're gonna see your homework. Here's your homework. I want you to do the new data analysis. State your nulls. Get your data. Make a make a conclusion. Write it up for me. That's it. That's all I want. Um, the step stuff can go out the window, right? We've graduated. This is the pinnacle of all psych stats classes when you get to this point. We've gotten here kind of early, actually. So I'm going to teach you some extra stats that will make you even better at stats. Um, my goal is to work on um, first, first thing. You know what? I think the lab's taking Chromebooks Alpha. So if not, send in a request via text to me and I'll give you a lecture on what you should do with scales, like how you combine your scales, how you know what questions suck and what questions don't suck. But I know there's a lab on that, so I'm going to leave that unless you want. So what we're trying to figure out is we're going to have to enter this data just like this. In th this is the example where you had the Larrys and Berries and Jerrys and all those fun people. They either watched Fox News or they didn't. They reported they were Republican or, or they were a Democrat. And so what we need to do is we need to run psych stats on this. So essentially, I need to get these, these values okay, into my program. And you're going to see me actually do it. It's going to be kind of a bit of a, a pain in the, in the butt. But... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to go into my program. And here's our intro stats program. I'm going to hide this guy, right? Like I know you might have some sometimes it does reload, you got to deal with that. Um you 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 might have just a little few problems. Number one thing if you have a problem, if it's minor, try to figure it out. But it, 
but if you spend more than 10 minutes on it, shoot me a text and I can probably give you an answer. Now, one of the things, one of the things that I'm just really, really kind of happy with is how this all turned out. So if you're, if you're in here and you don't see this, click on files and click on this stats.rmd. That's where, that's where the magic happens. This other stuff is just, it, it's, it's not necessarily complete. But here, I want to walk you through this one more time. One thing that I think is important to do is ignore the stuff over here. This doesn't impact you. I've really hooked you up. Okay, this is all the program R. And so now you can add a third program to your list and you can see everything I did to code for it. So one of the things I just want to do is show you at the beginning, there's a decision tree. If you don't know what test to run, you can answer these questions and it tells you what, what test to run. So it says, um, this is just ignore that section. These are things to help you out, to help your answers kind of not kill the program. How many samples do you have? Right. And think about this in terms of factorial ANOVA, you'd have like four or more samples. How many IVs do you have? So we have, we have like four samples of data. How many IVs do we have? We have two. Do we know these? Nope. Do you know your population? Nope. Was it between or within? Um, this won't, this won't impact your results at all. Um, you can put between or within. I don't care. How about we just say for you, you put between if it's all between and it's not. So it has a within component to it. So it's somewhat within. We click run. And you get this output, your stats, run a factorial ANOVA, complex ANOVA, whatever, right? I, I kind of like that, right? Then we get our one sample t-test. That's all here. I'm not going to run through that. One... One, oh, one sample Z, I misread it. Yeah, one sample Z, one sample T is next. We have the dependent samples T. We have the independent samples T. We have the one-way ANOVA. And then we get down to what I just, well, we got to get through all the code. Look, I just want to say, this took me a lot of work too. Like this was to make our lives easy. We got one way within, I forgot about. And, and we keep going, we keep going. We're at the end. Look at how much I typed up for you. I know you're like, oh, how is this easy to use? It's, it is easy to use. It's, it takes a while to just navigate to the right section. D an outlier detector. So here's the thing. I'm not going to have you do the outlier detectors for the homework. I just don't want you to do it. Um, there are no outliers. But essentially, if you did, what you have to do is you enter in your um, scores per cell. Okay. And let's say, I'm just going to put an outlier here so you can see. You put in your scores per cell. Now, that's two by two. When I say cell, I mean one of those combinations. So in this case, we're doing the studies with the Larrys and the Berries and the Harrys and the watching Fox News and the being a Republican or a Democrat. So a cell would be Republicans who watch Fox News. So all those scores go in here. I'm not going to put them in here, but, but if you find an outlier... And you got to remove that per, all that person's data from the entire data set. And, and, you know, I'm just letting you know that's what you should do. Um, I click run. What you'll see is this. You got your, you know, I programmed a lot. Not all the outliers question, is there an outlier here? Yet this one's an outlier. You would have to remove this 600 and all their data from the entire data set. And you would do that for each each um, each cell, okay? But that's how you would run the outliers. Then you get to your two-way ANOVA. And hint, if you look closely, you'll see how your data should be set up for your homework problem. I'm not going to let you see the results, but I'm going to go ahead. Oh, it hates me. I'm going to go ahead and put in the data from our example. So I just pasted it in there. You know, you could keep the, you know what? You know what makes more sense? Here, I'm going to undo all that stuff. You know what makes more sense? Just to bring that up, bring this up, kind of work it around so I can see it. Yeah, this makes more sense to me. All right. So now I got 
my data. And all I'm doing is adding them to a vector. That's what that, that C is important. The data has to be numbers. So I got one. I got five. I got three. I got eight. I got four. Yay. I got nine, seven, ten, six. Nine, eight, and eight. All right, these don't exist in this data set. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve observations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve observations. I got one, five, three, one, five, three. 849, 849, 7106, 7106, 988, 988. I entered my data correctly. Now I got to enter my participants. Well, luckily I've already done this, but it's Larry, Barry, Harry, Gary, Jerry, and then Carrie. Oh no, I got Carrie in there. So it's L Larry, Barry, Harry, Gary. Jerry, Carry, Yerry, Zary. I gotta, I gotta pull it over so you can see. Yerry, Zary, Dairy, Scary. So then all these go bye bye because there was less, less observations. So they go away. All right. Then I'm, then I'm double checking because like, you know, it's not like SPSS where it won't run. It'll probably run and just give you the wrong feedback. You'll have no idea. So take your time with entering your data. Larry, Barry, Harry. Larry, Barry, Harry. Gary, Jerry, Mary. Gary, Jerry, missed Mary. See, I would have messed up. And that was, that's a common mistake, right? I'm not going to, uh, I'll add the extra, or whatever. Oh, whatever. Take it away. Mary. Then I got Carrie, Yerry, Zary. Carrie, Yeri, Zeri, Ziri, Ziri, Dairy and Scary, Dairy and Scary. So we're all we're all on there. Now my independent variable one is just yes, no, alternating. So I'm just gonna yes, no, alternate this. Yes, no, yes, no. How many of these do I need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So what happened there? Look at this little X. It popped up. I just hovered over it and it said, hey, something's unexpected. I left a comma out of there. So if that happens to you, don't ignore those red Xs. Just go read what it said. Right? It'll take it a moment to see it. It's like unexpected token carry. Go to carry. Put a comma in. All right. So, and this is what I'm saying. Like, it, it even takes me time to do this and I have it written out, right? Like, take your time. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if you do small case, it'll it'll ruin it. So make sure these are all the same too. These Y's are Y's, these N's are N's. And I know it's a little tedious, but honestly, it's no more tedious than PSPP. 9... 10, 11, I'm double clicking and just replacing 12. So now we got all 12. I'm gonna double check that though. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then I'm, we got Republicans, then Democrats. So basically it ends here because I, I, built, I built your homework off this data set so clearly. So now let me just double check everything. What am I looking for? One, 12 observations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, which we already checked. Larry, Barry, Harry, Gary, Jerry, Mary, Carrie, Zary, 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 Dairy, Scary. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Here, I just entered these. And I'm like, okay, 
Uh, they all have to be, ca- are all my Y's capital Y's? Yes, 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 yes. Are all my N's capital N's? Yes, 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 yes. Do they have to be capital Y's and N's? No, they have to be the same. So just interpret that correctly. Okay, then I'm down here. I got my independent variable R, R. Do I got 12 of them? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yes, I do. R, all my D's the same. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Good. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Good. That matches my data over here. And now I I want to give my independent variable a one, one a name. And I already have them in there. News. Watch Fox. And my other variable is political orientation. So I just leave it like that. And then don't skip this step. This is the one that I skip all the time. So I'm going to delete some of these spaces here. You're going to see this data when you log in, hopefully, unless there's an error. Um, And then what you got is, is it within? Is it within? So we got, let's go here. The whole thing is between, I can see that, Larry Berry. We talked about that earlier. So is it within? No. you got to put that big N in there. If you don't put that big N, it's not going to be work, working. If you don't put the big Y, it's not going to work. Okay? But once you do that, your job's done, and you're going to be so stoked. I'm going to like make this big so you can see the whole thing. I click one button. You might have to download. You're going to have to download some packages. I'll show you that once I click my button because I'm, I'm excited. I click my button. It goes through. If you really want to see like when it's done, you just click on this guy and it's like, okay, nothing's happening down there. I click down here. I keep going. And let's look at this. So this is the console. If you have any errors, it'll tell you. You're going to get some warning messages. Don't worry. Those are for me, not for you. But if you have something weird, you don't get output, like read down there and and that's going to help me help you out. Now, there may be mistakes in this. Like there may be things that I code like that work right now, but won't work when we do it a different way. I've tested it all the ways that we should do a two by two ANOVA, but I don't know. So if you get a problem, please communicate the error message to me so that I can fix it. Part part of this is like really fun, but look, here's here's our graph. The one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't tell you what the IVs are, but I can work on that later. That's a problem for later. But we got no yes, right? Like I said, spend your time with your data. No yes. Um, watches Fox News, Democrat, Republican. Do I see anything here? Okay. So first thing, I'm just kind of looking at it, and I see that the pink bars are generally a little bit taller than the green bars. So I think, okay, Democrats made social distance more than Republicans, which is kind of a pattern we're seeing now. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just describing the world as it is, right? And there's reasons for this. Like, I get it. I understand why, actually. Um, People are watching different media sources, which is where this question came from. So I see that um, the, the pink bars are bigger than the green bars. And this appears particularly true for if they watch Fox News. Um, Republicans that watch Fox News appear to be social socially distancing the least than Republicans that don't. Um, telling me that some, it looks like something special is happening in that cell. Democrats that watch Fox News are social distancing a little bit less too. Um, I mean, if you watch that news station for at least the first weeks of the epidemic. They kept calling it the flu, you know? It's like, these things matter. So this is just made up data, so don't take it too too personal. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just trying to understand how media impacts, you know, our own behavior. And here, what I'm seeing is that in that Democrat condition, in Fox News, just hearing, maybe just hearing that it's called the flu, or they're just hearing somebody else say it's not a big deal makes you socially distance less. Do I know if there's an interaction here? Not really. There could be, though. And how would I test? Well, is that pink slope different than that green slope? Kind of. They're both negative, but that green slope seems much stronger. Or is the no slope different from... The yes slope a little bit. The the yes slope appears to be drastically like quite a bit 
more of a decrease. They're both negative, but I don't know. I can't eyeball that. But if I were to say it, I would say, if I find a two-way interaction, I'm going to say, oh yeah, totally. Now, which one makes the most sense? I think I'm going to look at Fox News versus not. I'm going to split it by IV1. And I'm going to look at um, yes, the yes slope versus the no slope. Cause I think that's the one that makes the most sense. I don't care. I don't want to break it by political party and just see like, like that one's not as interesting to me. It might be to you, but for me, I wouldn't break it by political party. It just wouldn't make sense to compare the pink to the blue, blue ones for me. I want to compare it watching Fox news to not, but that's just where my mind is today, right? Both are acceptable ways to break your data. So that is our first result right here mean standard deviations all right so you know we're back we got our results um okay i'm taking i take a little break what what happened was i found an error in the program and fixed it real quick but so now what we have here is we have our anova table and we can see like we have our independent variable watch fox, our political orientation, our interaction, our error term. We have our sums of squares. And those little bars are really interesting because when you compare them to error, they tell you partial eta squared. So look at this 33.3 plus 17.31, right? It's this over this plus this. You can see that that's accounting for about 66% of the variation there, right? So these different, these different like color bars actually tell you how strong, um, how much it's related to eta squared basically tells you what percentage of the total it accounts for. Now, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta understand that like this is an error and this is an error. So this shouldn't be counted. This shouldn't be counted against this. This is just a completely different thing. Okay. So then we have down here is the error. So it's like, of this plus this, what percentage does this account for? 66. This plus this, what percentage does this account for? This plus this, what percentage does this account for? Right? And you can see that overall, right? Like, like we got we got some good some good results here in this made up data. These are our variances, degrees of uh, some squares divided by degrees of freedom. I'm not flipping it. I don't care. I've been on this pro program too long. Um, our F scores are 95% confidence intervals of Fs and, and they're not perfectly balanced because the distribution isn't perfectly balanced. So don't expect them to be perfectly balanced. Okay. Same things here. So, you know, we know our signal to noise ratio is 14, 13, and about one. So really the interaction is, there's not much there. Our P value and confidence interval. So our P value is zero with the confidence interval, um, that goes from zero to 0 0.06. That's that's a real effect, um, for sure. Worst case scenario, it's massive. Best worst case scenario, it's significant. Best case scenario, it's significant. Um, here we got our p value is 0 0.01. Worst case scenario, it's significant. Well, best case scenario is very significant. Worst case scenario, it's not, but just barely. Keep that in mind, right? Am I saying that that effect doesn't exist? No, but like. It's also good to know, like, worst case scenario, the p-value is 0.13. Like, the chances of that being the true p-value are small. Let's run another study, make sure that's not the case. P-value is 0.16, 0 to 1. I have no idea. Could be significant, could be nothing, right? That's, I think that's um, really interesting there. Partial eta squareds, 66. It could be 11% to 81%. 61 could be 7% to 80%. 24 could be 0% to 57%. No big deal there. Now, these are follow-ups to the interactions. And I'm going to click here because it has it split by both different ways. So this is saying at Democrat, at Republican, N versus Y, yes versus no, at Democrat, N versus Y, yes versus no, at Republican. So what I see there is it took my data and it split by political orientation. But this, this one, which is going to fight with me no that's the <laughs> this other one okay split by watching fox news yes or no but essentially you're getting this you're, you're, you're getting um the basically the same information just looked at differently so you're getting a follow-up to the interaction here we didn't have one so we don't have to look at it but still i'm going to walk you through it essentially what they are is t-tests um here's your mean difference here's your confidence interval of the mean difference 
Um, mean difference confidence interval, that's negative 0.2 to 4, 2.4 to 6, 1.6. Um, T value confidence interval, negative 0.2 to positive 3.5. Confidence interval here, 2 to 5 with some numbers after that. P value here is 0.13, could be zero, could be as large as 0.58 with my 95% confidence interval. Zero, could be zero, could, it's in both cases, significant, significant. This one's significant, not significant. My Cohen's D here is telling me worst case scenario, a large effect in the opposite direction. Best case scenario, the largest effect I've ever observed in my entire world, life. That's a physics effect right there. And then here you have the same sort of relationship. You have a Cohen's D of large to large. Um, pretty good there. Uh, the same information, it's, it's presented differently. It's different groups, it's different comparisons, but split by no versus yes. You don't have to report this unless you have a significant interaction, but it's here. Mean difference, uh, confidence interval the mean difference so that you can see that that includes zero, so that p-value is going to be greater than 0.05, which it is. The t-value is going to include a negative one, and our Cohen's d is going to go from negative to positive, just like we know. Um, here we got a large mean difference, 95% confidence interval, 2.1 to 6.5. T-value, 3.61, low 1.7 to 5.47. P-value is 0.01. Best case scenario, um, or worst best case scenario, massively significant, zero. Uh, worst case scenario, 0 0.06. So I'm like 94% confident that this is p values uh, less than 0 0.05, right? Big deal. Um, so that's really there. And then your D, which goes from massive to mass, it's massive, goes from massive to massive. Same stuff. So, you know what? Of course, when I'm doing this, you got to wait for the, the, there is a table here. It just, I think it hates me today. Um, I'm going to go on to the last one. There we go. There, I knew it would come back. Um, it's HTML, so it has to render. So just just let it render if that happens to you. Um, these are your follow-ups for your main effects. So you wouldn't have to do these. We had a two by two, but they're still here. Um, you know, you would in this case you wouldn't have to do it, but it's still your mean difference, your confidence interval, the mean difference, t confidence interval of the t, p confidence interval of the p, um, d confidence interval of the d. You know, um, it's all there. So. Beautiful. The spacing's a little weird, so take your time. I, I'll fix that in a future version, but I'm not too worried about it right now. I'm not going over this one, same one here. It, now, would you need this? Nope. Would you need this? Nope. It's just there for you, okay? Would you need this? Nope. We did not have a significant effect. Would you need this? Nope. We did not have a significant effect. All right. Will we need this? Yep. Do we need that? Oh, God, yeah. And do we need this? Kind of. This is just... Easy um, descriptive statistics. I don't. I mean, it doesn't really matter. We've already seen them here, but I still want you to have them. So honestly, you got this. Spend time with this. Figure out what's going on. Spend time with this, and then look at the ones you want to look at. Right? You've got a choice between this one or this one. You don't look at them both. You look at this one or this one, and then these. It just depends. Did you have a significant effect? Well, let's see. Let's see. In this case. We did for watching Fox News. We did for political orientation, but we already know that these differences exist, right? So we already got those from the uh, from the ANOVA table because there's only two groups. There's not three. But if there's three groups, you're going to go down to these one-way ANOVA tests. This is it. These two are if you have a significant interaction. You only choose one, okay? And this is main effect one and main effect two. You only choose one of these, but it splits it both ways. And everything's there. So it's beautiful. And I'm happy. We've got a bet we've honestly got a better stats program, in my opinion, than SPSS or PSPP. Huzzah. And I did spend hours working on this. I want you all to know that. Like, I have been working on just the one way ANOVA since um oh my lord. I've been working on it like 12 hours a day since like Sunday or Monday. It's been a lot of work, so I want you to understand that. But also, what I think is really cool, those of you that want to get into stats, you can see exactly how I calculated stuff, and if you want to look at it, you want to figure it out, I can help you figure out what I did. I poorly commented my code because I was under a time crunch, so I'll have to explain to you what's going on, but I will gladly explain to you what's going on. Like, I'm... Give me a couple days rest because I just did a lot of work. I created an SPSS alternative in about two weeks. I need a break for a couple days. But after that, I'll be glad to talk stats all day, every day with you. 
And I'm going to move on to the... Okay, I'm, I'm torn, but I'm torn between two tests that I want to show you off the bat. One is the equivalence test, which is essentially our two means the same, which you can tell with the test. So, ha, ha, ha. While you can't say anything, when you retain your null and the stuff we've learned, there's other methods that will allow us to do that. And I want to teach you all some basic multiple regression so that none of you have to do median splits. Like our friend, like my friend Hannah sent me a text about that. Hannah, I got you. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you a good, a good way to test that. And anybody else who's doing a median split, I'm gonna get you the best way. I'm gonna get your power back. Okay. So I'm probably gonna choose equivalence test because it'll take me very little time to explain. But that's where we're going from here. You are now graduated to. Um, grad student level in my opinion okay you all are prepared to take a grad school stats class based on what I've seen and yes I'm a little bit behind in the homework but from now on for this homework guess what I'll be posting a video in a couple weeks of me solving it couple weeks I'm gonna give my give you all some time give me some time okay um, if I, if you really need the answers I can give you the answers but we're all going to have the same answer. So I think I think that's good to know. In terms of deadlines been getting questions, yeah, I don't care. In terms of tests, yeah, you got to be kidding yourself, okay? What the only thing we have to do now is analyze our data for this project and make sure we're doing that well. So that's how I'm designing the course. Um, I, and I always designed it that way. Your next test was going to be do your project, do your data for your project. And I would still love to be involved in that. Um, you can send me your data and I'll, I'll help you analyze it. Um, I'll run it through our programs. I mean, I'm not going to take that away. By the end of the year, I want you to analyze your data my way, right? I don't want you to necessarily just do it the way that you have to do for the manuscript or whatever. I want you to go into your data. I want you to take everything we've learned, confidence intervals and all that. I want you to look at your own study and tell me what you've discovered. Okay, that might mean you did a shitty study. That's okay, but you'll be able to pinpoint this. You won't, you know, with all these confidence intervals, you'll know and all these other things. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm, I figured out Zoom today. I'm not going to lie. The computer nerd was like a little like I didn't I was programming that thing for you all. And you, I want you all to know how many how much I spent on that. Uh, I spent basically from when I got kind of sick on Thursday till yesterday programming that thing for you all, running my own experiment, doing some other things in between. But uh, yeah, so, you know, you gotta understand like this class up until, I can't believe, I'm, one of the things I'm most upset about is that COVID-19 ruined my class with you all because our class has been one of my favorite and best classes ever in my entire life of teaching so I'm really sad to see that go you know like so you all don't have anything to worry about because when we like the thing that students who take me know is that like when the class goes well and students are doing their work like I get real generous with the grades I've surprised whole, whole classes with A's before I'm not gonna do that in this case because I need you to have some motivation but it's you you keep trying and it's gonna work out you know what I mean? Um, let me know if you're struggling with the homework, getting it in. Like, you know, you got my phone number. Let me know. I'll help you with it. I literally am there. And I have Zoom. And we're not going to have a Zoom class. I think that is a bad, 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 bad idea. But, you know, we are going to sit around and, like, have conversations. So I'll, I'll throw up Zoom hours every, you know, I'll be on Zoom. I'll figure out how it works, like, how to, like, Maybe always have a meeting. Maybe I'll just always have a meeting going. Um, but, uh, you know, like, y'all were a really good class. So you need to know that. So, like, at this time, here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn stats, and you're going to do a few little rinky-dink homeworks like this with my program that makes it super easy. So I hope you all enjoy. I'm still enjoying you, and I'm trying to figure out how to get you to that next statistical level. But we already got to the plateau of um, 
psych stats. Now, this is hard. The 2x2 two two Anova is made to be hard, but essentially, you have one main effect, another main effect, one interaction. You have a bunch of follow-up tests that are done for you automatically, and what you have to do is look at all your data and make conclusions, right? Write those conclusions up for me in a paragraph, and me and you are cool. Um, yeah, that's it. I know stuff's hard, and I know it, it had to suck to move back home, and some of us don't have our stuff, and, you know, I feel for you all, okay? I, it's really scary out there. So, you know, um, keep working on your stats. This too shall pass, and stay safe. Stay home. Stay inside. Um, use Instacart, right? If you're struggling, you know, reach out to people. Right, you reach out to me if you need something. Well, I'll see what I can do. I mean anything, literally. Y'all made my semester, so keep that in mind. So when it comes to like what's due, what's not due, I don't know because some of us are sick right now, right? I might get sick. Like I don't, I'm not really gonna keep too many deadlines. I think I gotta hold it there in case somebody drops off the map. But honestly, y'all are like a good class, so keep that in mind, all right? Sorry for the little, well, I'm not sorry about it. Sorry that I made this video way longer now by talking all that time. But I made it a lot shorter than it was. You should have seen it earlier. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to post this before 9 a.m. <laughs>